Welcome everybody to the Superfast Instagram Q&A. Let's get started. Superfast Instagram Q&A. This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Why does E, A over E, E, E over G sharp, A sounds so good? So the way that harmony chords came about in the Western tradition was that individual people would be singing individual melodies and then they would come together in some broader harmony. So if a harmony, so if a chord progression sounds internally logical, like this one, E, A over E, E, E over G sharp, A, it's because the individual melodies that make up those chords are themselves logical or easy to sing or easy to hear. So if you took this melody, which is simple but memorable, it's something that somebody would want to sing. These melodies make chords. And combine it with this melody, which is also simple and memorable. These melodies make chords. And then combine it with this melody, which is also simple and memorable. These melodies make chords. You get a chord progression which has a powerful but simple but also memorable and satisfying resolution. These melodies make chords. You can hear this effect and really feel the effect of well-constructed harmony more when you're in a group of people who are each singing melodies which are memorable and feel good to sing. Like if you remember that Grace Kelly challenge on TikTok from last year, people would harmonize with themselves by layering in a new melody every time so you could hear the harmonies being built. That at the core of it is really what harmony is melody with extra steps. So if you're writing chord progressions for people or for instrumentalists, try and make the individual melodies as strong and powerful and memorable as possible, and then you'll get harmony, which sounds really nice. Now the question, of course, is how do you get the melodies working with one another? And that is the million dollar question. That is the question that has been plaguing Western music for the past thousand years. It's literally the history of Western music is the history of polyphony or counterpoint, how you get different melodies working together. Different eras and different cultures have different answers to that question, but it really comes down to control of dissonance. How much dissonance you want between the voices. Do you want a lot by having a lot of minor seconds, or do you want to have a little by having like maybe just perfect fifths, for example? That's really what it comes down to. Also, if you wanna get really technical, there's a textbook called Harmony Through Melody, which is an attempt at rewriting Western music theory from the perspective that everything should be melody first and foremost. It's a pretty intense book. I don't fully agree with all of it, but it is an interesting look. Thoughts on C major seven, F major seven, add sharp four, D minor seven over E, G seven, A flat major seven. Now far be it from me from making aesthetic judgments on somebody's art, but for me, this music is Incorrect. You start out all right on a C major seven chord, a nice one major seven. From there you go to an F major seven with that add sharp four, the four major seven in the key. But then you get into some trouble on this third chord, this D minor seven over E. Now this chord sounds kind of crunchy because of the minor ninth dissonance between the F of the D minor seven and the E in the bass. But that in itself is not actually that much of a problem. It's just you gotta know how to resolve it right. A typical way of using this chord would be D minor seven over E to E seven flat nine to A minor. That would be, in one sense, the grammatically correct way of using this kind of harmonic vocabulary. But you didn't really do that. Instead, you went from this D minor seven over E to a G seven chord. There's some particular problems with that. You see, my brain has been afflicted by something, and that affliction is called jazz. When my brain and my ears hear the sound of D minor seven going to G seven, I automatically assign it the title of two five. I talk about this all the time, but I took part in a study a couple of years ago, which found that jazz improvisers were more readily able to pick out two five progressions than non jazz improvisers. The two minor seven chord going to the five seven chord is a very important part of the harmonic vocabulary of jazz music. And so because of my experience with the style, my brain is literally hardwired to hear harmony in a certain way. And when you throw in this E in the bass going to a G7, it sounds like a mistake to me. It sounds like the bass player f***ed up. This is what I mean about the harmony being wrong. You can make whatever creative decisions you'd like, but just know that your audience, because of their experience within the style, might literally have a neurophysiological reaction to things which deviate from it. You may have heard the phrase, you must learn the rules before you break them. 
Well, here's a clear example of why. Anyway, after that G7, we go to an A flat major seven, flat six major seven, which is a nice change of color. It's a little bit darker. We're going to a little bit spookier of a place, but where do we go from here? It feels very unresolved, at least in this context. I personally would want to hear some more dark colors before eventually resolving it back around to C major, like G7 going to A flat major seven, going to E flat major seven, the flat three major seven, which is also darker in the context of C, finally resolving to a C major seven. Again, I hate to say whether or not certain things in music are correct or incorrect, but in this case, I really do think that the original progression was not the one that you wanted. You can make whatever artistic decisions you would like, but an audience is going to listen to them with the expectations that come from genre and style. Like for example, if you wanted to, you could superimpose the sound of say a Chopin prelude with Scottish bagpipes. That's entirely within your artistic prerogative, but your audience is going to perceive it a certain way, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be spicy. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want to make some kind of commentary about Scottish traditional music and classical music. That's entirely on you. It's just that you can't take the audience out of your music. When you write D minor seven over E going to G seven, the audience is going to think that the bass player messed up a really simple chord progression. And I don't know, maybe that's what you want, but please don't make the bass player look bad by writing bad chord progressions. <laughs> What does it mean when people refer to Mingus's music as third stream? So the third stream is a term that was used to describe some of the experiments in the 1950s and 60s of combining jazz music and classical music into a third stream of music, whatever that might mean. Yeah, jazz musicians like Charles Mingus collaborating with classical musicians like Gunther Schuller. And the whole idea was to combine like the textural and rhythmic and improvisatory aspects of jazz music with like the large scale formal aspects of classical music into a whole new form of music and pretty much Nobody liked this thing. Because at the time, all the jazz musicians hated it because it, to them, sounded like jazz that couldn't swing. And all the classical musicians hated it because it sounded like some weird corruption of classical music. But Gunther Schuller and Charles Mingus had a very specific vision for this music as a unique hybrid of the two. Schuller would write that, I would simply hope for critics, amateur and professional, who could appraise the music on its own terms, not theirs. Now, this is kind of germane to what we were talking about before, about issues of right and wrong, correct and incorrect in music, and how expectations of genre can influence how music is perceived. There may be a little bit more nuance to me saying that this chord progression is wrong. It's just that out of context, out of the musical context of the sound, it's hard to say. Anyway, my favorite Mingus album that would probably be considered third stream is Let My Children Hear Music, which is the symphonic jazz record that's absolutely beautiful. It also has some of my favorite Mingus song title names like The Shoes of the Fisherman's Wife or some jive ass slippers. <laughs> and also Don't Be Afraid, The Clown's Afraid Too. Mingus's title game, unsurpassed, absolute legend. Love it. What is the craziest yet most beautiful sounding chord you can make? A flat minor nine over A flat major seven sus two over C. Maybe not the craziest, but I think it's a pretty beautiful one, right? Yeah. Why no classical bass, but classical guitar? Well, classical guitar is a tradition of playing classical music, which is an art form that was very popular prior to the invention of the bass guitar in the 1950s. Now, of course, the question is, why wasn't the bass guitar invented before the 1950s? Why wasn't it invented alongside the classical guitar? And the answer is technology. You needed to amplify those low frequencies in a way that didn't exist before the early 20th century. Now, if you've ever played an acoustic bass guitar like this one, you know just how acoustically quiet this thing is. It's just not able to compete with other instruments. It's barely able to compete with the sound of my speaking voice right now because bass frequencies require a much larger body in order to propagate properly, to be able to hear the nuance and feel the bass. This is why string bass and double bass is such a large instrument. And so the musical reason for this thing to even exist couldn't occur 
until after the advent of amplification, where we could actually feel the bass frequencies in a musical ensemble. Technology directly influences music, which is why we have the musical instruments that we do in the eras in which we have them. What do you think of AP Music Theory or similar classes, and should students take them? Well, I'm not sure if you should or shouldn't take AP Music Theory, but as we saw from me taking the AP Music Theory exam, the kind of music that you learn, the kind of harmonic vocabulary that you learn, is a very specific one. It is the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians, and there's nothing wrong with that, but remember, it represents a style that was popular 200 years ago. What is your favorite and least favorite thing about the music thing in New York City? The least favorite thing for me is definitely the schlep, which is the Yiddish term meaning carrying something from one place to the next. And in New York City, if you're trying to carry gear from your place to whatever venue you're going to, you're probably using public transportation since you probably don't own a car. And that is a real pain in the ass after a long time. Most people get very sick of that, especially going into their 30s like yours truly. And so I definitely do not enjoy the schlep. My favorite thing though, kind of goes alongside it, and that is the fact that in a given evening, you can experience so much music at the same time because there's so much music happening in a condensed area. You can go from place to place to place and see world-class musicians play right there in front of you. And that that's really exciting and that is really inspiring. It's the thing that made me want to move to New York City in the first place. And it's the thing that continues to keep me here. Music is immediate. Music's real, music's raw, and I love New York City for that. You think clickbait has become unavoidable for a content creator on YouTube? You know, creating an interesting title and an attention-grabbing title is nothing new. That's just what journalists have been doing for the past couple hundred years with newspapers, right? And so YouTube clickbait is kind of like the attention-grabbing headlines of 19th and 20th century newspapers. It's just in a different format. YouTubers have to compete in a very real way with Instagram and TikTok, which just throws content at users algorithmically, just hoping that you watch it. And I think it's just, I don't know, I don't wanna say more ethical, but it's just better to create an interesting title and thumbnail that gets people to engage with a video or content on their own terms, rather than being forced content, like when you watch TikTok or whatever. Now, if you wanna learn a little bit more about the craft of YouTube and what goes into running a YouTube channel, or if you have a YouTube channel of your own, highly recommend a class that you can take exclusively on Skillshare, YouTube Success Script Shoot and Edit with MKBHD. A very clear and insightful look into what goes into making a YouTube video from the very beginning to the very end. And that's a consideration just because it's useful in communicating certain things to actually show the thing. This class can be found on today's sponsor, Skillshare, the online learning community for creative and curious people like yourself who can go and learn new skills and explore their creativity. There are new premium classes which are launched every week so you can always be learning and discovering new things. And it's entirely ad-free so you can stay in the zone while you learn. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get a month of free Skillshare. So be sure to click that link in the description. Thank you everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Maybe check out some of my others. And until next time, everybody. Peace.